Okay. So um, I've basically what we would have done in one day, I've split over our three hours. And uh, we've got uh, an hour today, which is going to be uh, quite a bit of a background about Valencia itself. So you've got a bit of an, an idea of his cultural context. And then next week, it's going to focus very much about his um, sort of mid-career, his interest in social realism, and then his development of luminosity, for which he is most famous. And then the third, uh, last session, focused very much on this monumental series of paintings as he did for his American patron, Archer Huntingdon, which is in the Hispanic Society headquarters um, in New York, and it's called Visions of Spain. So that last session will be very much about how artists, well, literally not just Saroya, but his contemporaries, uh, create this illusion, if I, could dare, if I dare put it that way, of Spain. So today, uh, the, the, the lecture is sort of half and half. The first part will be a, a sort of bit of a travel log, taking you to Valencia, because as Scott, uh, as we were doing it yesterday, obviously you realise that, but as Scott and I were talking about it later, he said, do you know what, I wasn't quite sure where Valencia was until we went there. Uh, so this first slide is just to introduce you to uh, Saroya himself. Uh, the tile plaque down the bottom is on his birthplace which no longer, the building doesn't exist, but they've marked the spot. Uh, where he began his career in Valencia, uh, which was at really at the, what you and I would call an arts and crafts school. And then finally, the, the big one down the bottom is um, no longer there, I'm afraid. This is, was a huge monument uh, built uh, to Savoy and was opened 10 years after he died. So he died in 1923, this was opened in, either, in 1933, but it, it did not survive the Civil War. So there is a monument at Cicerolla, it's on the uh, coast, it's at um, Mal Malparosa, so I shall show you the monument later, but it doesn't look like that anymore, I'm afraid, uh, because it was significantly damaged, I understand, um, in the Spanish Civil War which was only a few years later, obviously, 1933. So this is just to remind you, I know this sounds ridiculous, but we did have a few questions about this yesterday. So I've come for armed today, just to, to point out that we are actually not in Spain uh, when we are in Valencia, we are in uh, the La Catalonia. So this is just to remind you of the complexities of Catalonia um, because it stretches into what you and I would think of as France in the north, this is known as Northern Catalonia. And you can see up on the map at the top there where it said France and Perpignan, as you're perfectly aware, um, is in France. Uh, so if we were to unite all the Catalan lands, we would have to take back quite a big chunk of France. There's Barcelona, uh, there is Tarragona, and in, in, inevitably they haven't put Valencia on that map. But if we drop down to this one here, you can see it's actually divided into regions. So Northern Catalan, Central Catalan, which of course is Barcelona. And then this is the Valencian bit down here. So it's this bit here that sticks out south of uh, Tarragona. And in fact, not far from Tarragona is Rios, uh, which is um, another very important artistic centre uh, for Catalan culture. Quite a few of the important architects and artists come um, from Rios, um, a chap called Fortuny in particular, more of him later. And then uh, the big map on the left hand side, you can actually see properly where Valencia is. It's in that this sort of almost like a bay, isn't it? It is, of course, a very important port. It's the second city um, in uh, Catalonia after Barcelona. And you can also see that the Balearic Islands are uh, Catalan as well. They're joined together by their native language, in case you're wondering how these maps are, um, you know, created. Uh, which, so not only do we have the Balearic Islands, but we also have a little tiny bit of Sardinia uh, that would technically have to become part of the Catalan Kingdom. So you can perhaps, perhaps understand more fully now the complexities of uh, Catalonia wanting independence from Spain could get very messy, couldn't it, if they wanted bits of Sardinia back and France. I don't think that's likely to happen, but 
perhaps that gives you a better idea of the nationalism of this area. It'll help you to understand Soroya because he's not, he's not just Spanish, he's, he's Catalan. He's part of this incredible renaissance of art that occurs in the uh, Catalan area at the end of the 19th, early 20th century. I'm sure many of you have been to Barcelona and will have encountered their modernista. This is not the same as modernism, which does not emerge until after the First World War. Uh, modernismo, modernista, is the name that the Spanish, or the Catalan, I should say, uh, scholars give to Art Nouveau in the Catalan areas, modernista. So Antonio Gaudi, he's modernista. Dominic y Montanay and Puig de Cadafalt. These are the architects that you might have come across when you've been to visit Barcelona. You also might have come across the great Catalan artists of this period, like uh, Casas and uh, Rossignol. You're going to see some of their work later because I want to try and indicate that Soroya is not standing alone. He is part of what you and I would call a renaissance. And the modernista movement starts in Barcelona really around about um, 1889. It's right very end of the 19th century, having its heyday in what you and I would call the Edwardian period, you know, from 1900 to the First World War. And it wasn't just about architecture or the decorative arts or even painting. This renaissance of Catalan culture obviously embraced music, and also importantly literature, because as I've already explained, the basis of identifying Catalan culture is really down to its language, which had been suppressed by the Spanish. And so this is the reason why you have this sudden outpouring of Catalan um, national identity, uh, very much about their identity rooted uh, in their language. So here he is, uh, Soroya. So another thing to explain um, is the way they write their names. So you'll see that the names are always in, in this arranged like a threesome. Uh, so we know him as Soro, Soroya, okay, because it's a double L. So remember, this is not Spanish, this is Catalan, this is Soroya. And then Bastida is the name of his mother. So the full name of Antonio Gaudi is actually Antonio Gaudi, Gaudi e Corine. Corine being the name of his mother. So this is the standard way for writing a name um, in Spain. Uh, so we have to know them by their middle name, which might be a bit confusing to you. So let's, that's got what, that one out of the way. And also how to pronounce his name, which is, as I said, uh, Soroya. And he is depicted here by Maurinio Benuri. Again, remember it's a double L. And Benu the Benuri family is a dynasty. Uh, there's two brothers and a son, and they are contemporaries of Soroya. Uh, Marinio was actually the closer friend uh, to Soroya, and there are several important sculptures, sculptures of Soroya by Marinio Benuri, the most famous one being for the Hispanic Society of New York. More of that later. But, you know, just remember that uh, Soroya is hugely popular in America after at 1909, which is when he's invited by Archer Huntington uh, to present his paintings in New York. And that's the invitation, 1909, and then the, uh, a few years later, the exhibition really puts Soroya on the American map. And then he's commissioned by Archer Huntington, as in the famous Huntington Beach of California and the Huntington Collection in Pasadena. He's commissioned by Archer Huntington to produce this a monumental uh, sequence of paintings, 14 in all, but they're massive, on the visions of Spain. So most of us, in, uh, well, most of us encountered Soroya for the first time when we had the exhibition at the National Gallery just a few years ago. And if, you, if I was to say to you where, where to go to see the best Soroyas, I would have to say his studio house um, in Madrid which he did not construct, as you can see, until 1909, 1910, by which time he is rich and famous. And we could compare this studio house to Lord Leighton's studio house in uh, Kensington. But of course, his career doesn't start in Madrid. He moves to Madrid when he marries Clotilde, 
you, if I put my, my cursor over her, she's down here. And uh, the collection that you're seeing is the family collection, which was uh, passed to Clotilde because uh, Soraya uh, dies, as you know, quite young, 1923. And then it's passed to her son, uh, to their son, I should say, and it's now the Soroya Museum. So if I was to say where to go to see the best Soroyas, I would have to say to Madrid. But really, uh, his birthplace is going to be, remain really important at the Soroya, particularly for those beach scenes that we now very much associate with him. You can see one of them straight in front of you, uh, the one I really love, which is of his wife and his daughter, uh, Maria, uh, walking along the beach in Valencia. He has a very tough uh, start in life. So his uh, parents, I'm submitting somebody, um, his parents die only two years after he's born. He's orphaned at the age of two and will be raised by his maternal uncle, um, who is a locksmith. Uh, so Soroya's you know, start in life is that he's going to become an artisan. And he's born in a, you know, in a, a so-called fishing neighbourhood, which again will come back to haunt him because, as you know, many of his most famous images are indeed, uh, they sort of split between children on the beach and fishermen on the beach. He only has the one sister, uh, Concha, again, remember, because they're both orphaned um, only two years after he is born. So what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to sort of give you an idea of what exactly uh, Valencia looks like, to give you, you know, a flavour of the city, uh, which may not be known to you. If it is, hopefully this will bring back some lovely memories. And I have to say, having heard about the jab, I'm looking forward to going back to sitting in the square here uh, in front of the cathedral in Valencia and, um, you know, enjoying the life that we enjoyed, well, the life that we enjoyed uh, before lockdown. So this is the cathedral in the centre of Valencia. And all of these um, places, I mean, he basically lives in Valencia until 1890. And then he returns constantly to paint on the beach. Uh, so Valencia is, you know, is rooted in his psyche. But I wanted to give you a flavour of the city and the sites that would have been very familiar to Soroya. And there's a, a, you know, there's a walk that you can do. The tourist um, office will give you a, a Soroya walk so that you can walk around and see all the sites associated with his life and with his paintings. Now, you might think the cathedral looks a bit odd. It is. Um, it was never completed. A combination of the fact that we are in an area that had to be conquered from the Saracens, more of that in a minute, um, but also the Black Death. So the cathedral was never finished and it has a very strange footprint, as you can see, uh, with standing separately to one side, the Miguleta, which is like a Campanile or bell tower. Then the, the floozy and the jacuzzi, anybody from Birmingham will know what I'm referring to, um, here uh, in front of the Bishop's Palace on the left hand side. But we're going to see here an aerial view now looking out over Valencia. Uh, now this is the Tower of Santa Catarina which is where the Soroya was baptised. Um, hopefully if my cursor is working there's a, a church on the left hand side, not such a tall tower, and that is, is where he will marry uh, Clotilde. And then if we carry on a little bit further over to the left, uh, you can see right on the edge of the screen, another church tower. And it was in this area where my cursor is sort of like between this main road and that tower, that Soroya had his first studio. So, you know, all of this of course is before he uh, settles. And he settles in Madrid essentially because he thinks that it's going to be a better market for him to develop his practice as a commercial painter. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start from the station uh, to show you how Valencia was being transformed uh, during uh, Soroya's lifetime, but it was moving from um, ancient medieval, it's a Phoenician city by the way, in terms of its foundation, and moving into the 20th century. So there's a map here just to help us in terms of locating um, everything. So this is the art gallery. So the river, right, the river Turia, I should point out immediately, is not there anymore. Uh, the river Turia uh, was drained uh, after a terrible flood 
um, in Valencia in the 1950s, the authorities literally moved the river away. It, this was a really awful flood, many people died. So if you've been to visit Valencia, you'll now know that this is now a park and leads down to the, the modern city, the city of the future uh, by Calatrava, which is, um, you know, is a story and a visit in its own right. But if we go to the center of uh, the old town, you can see all these lovely little winding medieval roads. Uh, the cross in the center is the cathedral. Uh, the Plaza de la Rienne, which is what you were just looking down on, which is one side of the cathedral. The Longa, which is the silk exchange, a very important uh, late medieval Renaissance building in the heart of Valencia, literally opposite the central, central uh, market or Mercado. These are all places that would have been very, very familiar uh, to Soroya. What was going on whilst after he left uh, for Madrid um, is all this lot down here. So bottom right hand corner, you can see how completely different the road layout is here. Um, this of course is the exemplar. If you've been to Barcelona, you'll know exactly what an exemplar is. It's an extension. And rather having, than having all the medieval roads, all the, you know, all you know, interconnecting and very erratic, uh, the exemplar is laid out on a grid uh, system based on the architect Cerda. Cerda is the one who's in charge of the exemplar in Barcelona and he comes up with this rather neat idea of creating blocks of buildings but with the corners chopped off. You see here like the each um, edge of the block is given, um, a, you know, is given an edge which meant that you had these rather nice little squares in the center of each block and opening it up a bit so it's not quite as intense as the blocks that you would encounter if you went to New York. And this is just to show you just how if you do your your walk of Soroya just how many sites there are in the city that are associated with him. As I said unfortunately his birthplace number one um, is now commemorated by a plaque. You'll see it in a, uh, in a minute. And then 18 is uh, the, um, these are all the churches. Number two is the important one. This is Santa Catalina, where he was uh, baptized. And um, if we look at the bigger map at the top, you can see here the beach. Uh, you know, so you've got like two Valencians. You've got the old town and the exemplar, number six, on the map is in the exemplar, which was where this his first um, academic, where his academic career took off. But then most importantly, you've got the uh, sites here associated uh, with the beach, which is Mal, uh, Malvarosa. Malvarosa is its modern name. It's got various different names in the 19th century, but today it's known as the beach at Malvarosa. Lovely names. So we're going to start with, and remember I'm dyslexic, so I'm bound to make lots of mistakes with both the Catalan language and the Spanish one, so my apologies straight away. Uh, so we're going to start with the station to show you how uh, Valencia was modernising, and this is the important thing to remember about Soroya, is he starts off as being a very traditional 19th century painter with your typical academic training, uh, both initially in Valencia and then in Rome, then he'll go to Paris and that will open up his eyes to modern art. And then by 1900, he's become part of a, a modern artistic movement, which is rooted in en plein air painting. So we're now sort of looking at this completely differently. He belongs to a generation of artists that includes a uh, singer Sargent, uh, a chap called uh, Peda Croya, uh, who is uh, Danish, Anders Zorn, who is Swedish, Axel Gallen Kalila, who is Finnish, and then you've got the Glasgow Boys and the Newland School. And we're now sort of reappraising these artists at the end of the 19th century because what really binds them together is naturalism and this overwhelming uh, tendency, well, desire really, uh, to paint directly from nature out of doors or en plein air, uh, which is the technical term. So we're going, we're to, our story is of Soroya moving from traditional to modern, 
And the same thing can be seen happening in his hometown. So the most important modernist building um, in Valencia is undoubtedly the North Station by Dimitro Ribes, uh, built as you can see over a long period. And I have to confess, this is, um, this is from Google Earth because it's a mess in front of the station at the moment, building works. Here closer up, you can see a wonderful eagle, but what I really wanted you to look at is the detail of the oranges and the roses, uh, two emblems that are indicative not just of Valencia, but of uh, Barcelona and you know, the Catalan uh, tra um, traditions. Because the rose is very much associated with St George and the dragon, and he is the patron saint of the Catalan lands. And that, but most importantly here, oranges, because that's one of the most important commodities uh, of the area. It's not the bread basket of Spain, it's the fruit basket of Spain, but also the other really important commodity is rice, uh, because this is the home of paella. You can see here also the very distinctive uh, heraldic device for Valencia. So it has the yellow and red stripes that you might associate with Barcelona, the double L's, which means that Valencia is doubly loyal, and then the crown above. But I'll explain a bit more of that um, in a minute. Uh, the building is covered with most wonderful mosaics. And you can see immediately the sort of colorful local costumes. In Valencia, they have this amazing festival held every spring the Festival of Fire. Uh, they make these amazing effigies and then set fire to them. It costs a fortune, evidently. And all the ladies dress up in their regional costume. It's the, the festival is known as the Falara, and the multiple, you know, many, many women dressed. The, the Falaras ladies uh, in their, you know, these, I, mean, I don't think anybody ever went um, picking oranges so beautifully decked out. They're in their Sunday vest, is what I'm trying to say. So on the left, our young lady again, roses and oranges. And I do rather like my close up, which is sort of a lady sort of shining the way with her lamp. It's supposed to just to represent the con concepts of, of uh, the richness of the Valencian countryside and uh, modern technology. I like that idea. And uh, you'll see immediately from the inside of the building, the huge influence coming from Barcelona. Now, I know you all know Antonio Gaudí, but in fact, the most influential architect in Barcelona was Domines y Montané, uh, who was famous for his Palau de Catalunya, the music hall, and also his amazing hospital, San Paul, both of which, of course, have survived. And uh, you can also see another very indicative technique in tile used by Domines, and this is Trancadis. This is the broken tile that you see here on the ceiling and on the column. And my close-up of the column uh, gives you your oranges and your roses. Again, uh, you know, reinforcing this idea of the fecundity of the area. And you can perhaps see now the Trancadis, which is the broken bits, like patio, uh, you know, pays, a crazy paving. This technique, which was particularly used by Domenech less so uh, by Gaudi, but if you've ever been to the park well, you'll have come across it there. So here's what was the, the where you got your tickets, the booking hall. It's quite impressive, isn't it? And uh, Valencia is really important in the history of uh, Spanish ceramics. It's the home of Hispano Moresque wear. So it was always a really important ceramic center. My reason for showing you these is again to emphasize the, the unique character of the Valencian countryside. There is this area uh, known as the Albufeira or the small sea, very distinctive architecture. When I first saw these, I thought, are we in Spain or are we in South America? There are obvious links. Um, but you know, the white adobe houses with their crosses on and the lushness of the vegetation just sort of give me a little bit of a of a qualm that I wasn't actually anywhere near Valencia, but this is the unique character of the Alba Fura. Uh, it's not just these unusual cottages, and the tiles, by the way, as you can see, are magnificent, and uh, use a technique, by the way, if you're interested, called tube lining, to get this wonderful cloisonne effect. But it's also at this end, this inland uh, sea or inland lake, 
where you have these very distinctive votes, which are going to pop up, as you know, uh, when we start to look at a Soroya. So this is what I mean. These very distinctive uh, ships, or I should say boats, with these tri big triangular sails, uh, which were used by all the local fishermen. They're very uh, narrow, um, very low draft, these boats. They're, they're designed for fishing close to the land. And in fact, it's sometimes referred to as bull fishing, uh, as we'll see later, because the bulls were used uh, to pull the boats out and in and out of sea. Uh, so the Albafura, again, it's this idea of establishing the regional identity. And I love, as you go around the station, you have all these little plaques in mosaic saying, bon voyage, or, you know, have a good journey. There's an international element. So one of the interesting things about studying modern Easter in Barcelona and in Valencia is it's a, a heady cocktail of national identity, but also internationalism, because all of these architects and designers are used to a world stage through the big international exhibitions. And by 1900, uh, Sir Royal will know Singer Sargent, He'll have met Anders Zorn, and he will, is a, a good correspondence, in fact, between both of those artists, and he's fully aware of Croyer. So you mustn't think that they were sort of somehow, you know, blinded by their nationalism. They sometimes, somehow managed to balance the two, both inward and outward looking at the same time. So we're now in the main square. You know, I can never say the name of this. It means literally the town hall square. There have been many debates about renaming it over the years. It's had all sorts of uh, royal names and uh, in, uh, names associated uh, with uh, various political figures in Spanish history, but I think they've gone for neutrality at the Town Hall Square. On the balcony you know, that you're looking at here, uh, you can see the flags, where the flags are. But the balcony again is one of the tourist attractions for those of us walking in the steps of uh, Soroya, as it was here that he was given the keys to the city. And above it, we have the coat of arms of Valencia, very distinctive with uh, the, what I think of as the Barcelona stripes, the red and the white, uh, yeah, sorry, red and yellow bands of the Catalan flag and then a crown, and then the confusing part, a bat. Okay, and this is very distinctive for Valencia and goes back to an urban myth. So uh, James I, known as the Conquistador, uh, pushes the Saracens um, out of Valencia. It's a hard fought campaign. Uh, the city is laid sieged too three young years, big battle, 9th of October, 1238. There's one date that you have to remember for Valencia. It's this date of 1238. And this is the reason for the double L's. Uh, it is known as doubly loyal. And the reason for the bat is that according to the legend, when James I was preparing to go into battle, the flag, by the way, has survived. You can see it on the right, and at the top there is a bat. And the legend is that whilst he was waiting to go into battle and holding his standard, a bat came down and settled on it. This is highly unlikely, um, but then they didn't quite get the idea that it was a bat, and so sometimes the bat looks more like a dragon, which of course fits in with Sir George and the dragon. So we've got James I here uh, wearing a dragon on his helmet, and then the tradition of the bat, but that's the reason for the Valencian bat. I understand they're also very plentiful in the area, not dragons, but bats. So opposite the town, we have this confection, it's like a wedding cake, it's the post office. Uh, it's almost, uh, it's in almost tipping into the Art Deco period, isn't it? 1920s, but it's hardly an Art Deco building. It looks like it's got its own Eiffel Tower, uh, which I understand is to do with the fact that it was one of the first um, telegram stations um, in Spain, telegraphing. But the important thing is you can see here how it was really hard to get people to move away from these grand historic styles. Whereas the market is very obviously in a modernista style. It's not uh, by Ribes or Moira, who are the two big local modernista architects. 
It's by Sola and Guadi, and it's huge. It takes those years, 1910 to 1923, uh, because it's extended. It uses a lot of glass, a lot of metal, and most importantly, a lot of tile. So this is inside, and that you couldn't see the dome from the outside. It has this wonderful dome in the center, but it is nowhere near as beautiful as the Colon Market, which is by uh, Moira, which you'll find in the Exemplar area. Uh, now, it looks a little different today. It does, you know, I love the Central Market is a market teeming with uh, food and local colour. Not quite the same here at the Colon Market. Colon, by the way, is Christopher Columbus's uh, name. And the reason for this is, is it's been gentrified. So rather than being a food market now, it's for tapas, uh, drinking, enjoying yourselves, and you go down to a shopping mall underneath. This is what it looks like from the outside. Absolutely magnificent use of brick, glass, and uh, metal, and obviously tile. And here's a close up of the front. Uh, the mosaics to either side again have got our beautifully dressed uh, Thalora ladies in their local costume, uh, picking oranges and grapes. And then I'm going to show you a close up of these. I love again, you can see the influence, can't you, coming in here of the Barcelona modernist architects. So our ladies here, again, overly dressed. I don't think they ever went fruit picking so beautifully attired. And here they are, so picking flowers and oranges on one side and grapes on the other. And lots of sort of fun, like these are crabs and shellfish to do with it being a food market. And right at the top, I'm not quite sure what the top section is. Is it some sort of banana leaf? But the important thing here is this rather charming cow uh, greeting you as you enter the market. And it's around the colon that you will find the most overt um, Art Nouveau, remember, modern Easter architecture. So this is all pre uh, First World War. And this really emphasizes, I think, the internationalism. So on the one hand, you've got this strong desire to revive um, Renaissance of Catalan culture, but they are very outward looking. So the window that you see here is very clearly influenced by what's going on in France and in Belgium, Brussels in particular, Victor Horta. Next, literally next door to it is a building that could have come straight from Vienna. It looks like the great Viennese architect Otto Wagner had a hand in it. And then on this side here, so these are all around the Colon Market. We have a building that again uh, looks more French uh, than Spanish with the design of those windows. So there's this huge desire to, be, to, to enter the modern world in 1900, to come up with styles that were indicative of this new uh, modern era, particularly the use of glass and metal and my favorite material, tile. But it was very hard to detach oneself from that Gothic past. So one of the most uh, memorable modern Easter buildings in Valencia is this one here, known inevitably as the House of the Dragons. Remember, patron saint of Barcelona, St. George and the Dragon and the Roses relating uh, to him decapitating the dragon and where the blood spills, the roses grow, and then he hands one of the red roses colored by the dragon's blood uh, to his princess who he has saved. So here's a lovely close up of one of the big dragons on the dragon house. And it's important that you sort of realize that all of this helps to shape uh, the outlook of Soroya, that you know he grows up in a city that is only on the cusp of becoming modern, that he is sort of surrounded by all this uh, Gothic heritage. And some of his paintings, uh, particularly the ones produced in Italy when he's living in Assisi, this one would have been painted in Assisi, again, a, a very overt, really, in Assisi, a uh, Gothic environment. So here, to introduce uh, the young Soroya, we have a saint in prayer. This is a very important painting for him. Um, it stayed in the family. You're going to see it popping up in the background of his uh, later works. I, I rather like the way she has um, a golden disc behind her. So hence, saint in prayer. That's like her halo 
and then it's a beautiful sort of combination of Islamic and Gothic uh, patterning. Right, so let's get, get down to business in terms of Soroya's early life. So we've discovered already that he was born right in the heart of the old medieval town of Valencia to quite wealthy uh, bourgeois parents. But unfortunately, we think they died in a cholera epidemic, which left them orphaned when Soroya was only two years old. He is then raised by his aunt and uncle, a nice couple, but uh, very much of the artisan class. His father is a locksmith. Uh, sorry, his uncle is a locksmith. And so you can imagine that their aspirations are, are relatively limited. So his birthplace is marked here by this plaque, which as you can see is picking out the boats and those bulls that are such a feature of his later paintings. And hopefully you've noticed here at the top the heraldic device for Valencia, but the building is no more, it's long gone. But remember, even after he's left to go and li live in Madrid in 1890, but he constantly comes back to paint on the beach. So uh, he is uh, baptised uh, in the church of Santa Catalina. I'm relieved to say that its inside interior is still austerely Gothic, as you can see. Hasn't, had, uh, in, hasn't been overwhelmed by Baroque architecture, which is so popular in Spain in the 17th century. This is the front facade. Again, that many of the churches are never completed because remember that the area is, is only conquered, reconquered in 1238. And then the Black Death hits in the opening years of the 14th century. This is the, one of the reasons why many of the buildings are not completed. But the Campanile of the church um, is uh, completed in the Renaissance era. And this is the distinctive Campanile of Santa Catalina. Directly opposite is a Hochata area. Gosh, that's a mouthful. Uh, Hochata of tiger nuts. This is a local uh, delicacy. It's like a milky drink made out of tiger nuts. And I can assure you, it's what Savoya would have been raised on. It's a local delicacy. So remembering that his uncle was a locksmith, um, you know, Essentially, the young Savoya is, is on a path to become an artisan. So he will go to, uh, this is a new building, but this is the establishment that he went to, uh, the Escuela de Artisanos, uh, which is essentially an arts and crafts school. So he would have been going here uh, to learn skills. But inevitably, his talent as a draftsman stands out, and he is um, sent to the next level up, which is the Escuela Superior del Bellas Artes of Valencia, which is like their Royal Academy, okay? So it's like a Royal Academy, it's going to have the same sort of strict um, ideas about copying from the old masters, uh, studying previous Spanish masters, Velazquez, Goya, and Ribera. And the school has now left the building and is now known as the Carmen Cultural Center. So here's the front of it, which is at late Renaissance. If you're into uh, Ascending orders, you'll love it. There's some Baroque twisty columns at the top. And uh, on the other side, we're looking at the cloisters. So it's used now as a cultural center for uh, you know, temporary exhibitions. However, most importantly in our story, he's only, he's only in his mid-teens, remember, uh, when he goes to the academy. And he will meet uh, Tono Garcia, uh, who is the son of Antonio Garcia who is probably Valencia's best known photographer. And clearly Garcia takes a shine to the young uh, Soroya and he gives him work, retouching his photographs, helping with lighting and perhaps painting backdrops. And he will even encourage him to use his studio uh, for his own work. So he becomes like a father figure. This is a portrait of him painted much later, 1908. It's in a bank collection, that's the BBVA. A lot of Soroya's works are in Spain, like the Santander art collection. They, they, know, they, they know where their money is best put. Uh, but most importantly, it will be um, Garcia's daughter, Clotilde, uh, that Soroya will fall in love with and eventually marry um, a little bit later on. They don't marry until 1888. 
So his first actual independent studio is on the Calais de Saint Martin. So again, this is right in the old town centre. And he uh, will start his academic training by going to Madrid. Hang on, Susan's coming back. Going to Madrid and um, studying all the old masters. And like many of his generation, the ones that he's attracted to are Velázquez, Goya and Rivera. His first exhibited works are seascapes. They're not very well received. But again, it shows you that, again, this idea of painting the sea at Valencia is pretty much ingrained um, in his outlook. Hang on. Yeah. Uh, so remembering it, what is expected of him, you've got to balance here uh, in order to get grants, uh, to, in order to uh, facilitate his career, he's got to paint what is expected of him. And was, what was expected at the academies at this stage in the 1880s was history painting. It's the top end of the spectrum. So he didn't do very well with his, uh, you know, his seascape, but he makes a splash with his version of the 2nd of May, 1880. 8, sorry, 2nd of May 1808. And this is clearly a reworking of the very famous painting by Goya, 2nd of May 1808, in which he would have seen in the Prado. And I'm sure you're much more familiar with the one that comes after, 3rd of May 1808 by Goya, uh, where they are all being executed. But the important thing is, is this is exactly what the Academy wanted and was very dependent, as you can see, on figure painting. His next big success of 1884, because he's trying to get a grant, he wants to go to Rome. There's an, a school in Rome, it's literally known as the Spanish Academy in Rome. And this was where all the artists wanted to go, um, but it, it, it needed funding. So the same is true in France. Every artist wanted the great prize, the Prix de Rome, to facilitate their academic uh, training. So this was, hang on, just letting somebody in. This was uh, his path to success. It's known as the Cry of the Straw Seller, which is based on Vincent Domenech, who was a great national hero from the Peninsula War. He's standing on the steps here in front of the Luya, uh, which is the silk exchange, you'll see it in a minute, uh, uh, getting all the locals geared up to fight Napoleon. It's still in Valencia. It's in the Palau de la Generalata, Valencia. It's a mouthful, but it's not easy to see them. This is the Lord, now it's the home of the Lord Mayor. It's the old uh, town hall. So they have a wonderful collection of Soroyas, but they're not often made available to the public. Probably you'd only get in with a group tour or a special arrangement, and they only occasionally let us uh, tourists in. And this is the building, it's a very beautiful Renaissance building, uh, virtually opposite the cathedral. So in uh, the legend is that the, the straw crier, uh, Domenech, oh, uh, is, is said to have been based on uh, the, uh, the steps in front of the longer, which is the silk exchange. It's where all the money comes from in the medieval and Renaissance period. The only steps I know are the ones on the right hand side. You can just see some people coming down and are obscured by dustbins and umbrellas. Those are the only steps that I know uh, in front of the Silk Exchange. But we also know that he painted it out of doors. So right from the very outset, even when he is producing his historical works, he is painting them on plein air. He is painting, in this case, um, his straw, you know, his um, this character uh, rallying the troops was allegedly painted in the bull ring in full sunlight. So just so that, you know, we're covering all of our bases, this is the inside of the Silk Exchange, a really remarkable Renaissance building, or late medieval Renaissance building, with its very distinctive twisted columns. But here, back to the painting. So these, uh, allegedly on the steps of the Silk Exchange, we do know the palatair is, the, is painted in the ball ring in bright sunlight. You can see it here squared up, but most importantly, what you can see is how it has a vivacity, um, a fluid use of paint, uh, which gets congealed um, in the final version. Again, this is the academic way in the 1880s. 
and already you're going to prefer his studies to the final work. So here is a Domenech, El Palatea, our straw seller, uh, commemorated in one of the monumental sculptures in uh, Valencia. But I think you'll agree the study of 1884 by Soroya um, of just his head um, is much more appealing. So he's, the most important thing is that this painting does exactly what the Soria wants. It secures for him that all important grant to go to Rome. But having got to Rome, of course, he's got to send back works that are still acceptable uh, to the Academy. So he's only 22, he's off to Rome, he's going to be there till 1889, he'll get married um, in 1888. Uh, he will become friends here with lots of people, but Pedro Gil Moreno de Moira, a fellow painter, he, he's important, he's rich, and he is able to take uh, Soroya to Paris in 1885, which is a watershed in Soroya's career. But for now, 1885 to 89, about four years, um, he's going to be living and working either in Rome or in Assisi. And this is the type of work that he was sending back to show his development as an artist. I think it's lovely, these nude studies, but you know, it's this idea of showing the authorities that he was developing as a figure painter. Uh, he was also obviously thinking along commercial lines. So you'll know that one of the uh, most famous paintings by Velazquez is the Rokeby Venus. So here we have a modern version of her, 1887 of a backhand resting. Um, it's much more fluidly painted. Um, it's actually beautifully painted already. And look at the thickness and the impasto of the strokes. But the subject rather reminds me of Alma Tadema. Very commercial. So he hoped, this is the next sort of big landmark in his career, he hoped again that his monumental burial of Christ would cement um, his academic career. It completely and utterly flopped. The authorities didn't like it, it was too realistic, not much of it survives. In a fit of pique it was cut up afterwards, so I can only show you this rather bad uh, black and white photograph. And it's at this point that he seems to decamp to Assisi with his friend, Jose Benuri, who we also know uh, went to Assisi at this time. And this is the background. So this was painted in Assisi. So you see, so, you know, I was trying to emphasize the sort of, the sort of medieval undercurrent that runs through uh, Soroya. Perhaps it's important to think about, you know, what that means emotionally, because feeling is very important uh, for uh, Soroya. Um, you know, when we get to see his mature works, there, there's um, an emotionalism in them that perhaps comes from the Gothic and the romantic. But here in Assisi, he paints a father Joffrey uh, protecting a madman from being stoned, 1887. Exactly what the authorities wanted, and the authorities ended up getting it, as you can see. It's back in that Palau uh, Generalata uh, in Valencia. So it survived, but it's difficult to see. And the story here is of Father Joffrey, who uh, founded the first mental institution. I think in the world, but certainly in Valencia. And here he is trying to protect um, a victim from being stoned. This is exactly what the authorities wanted. So this is one of the men that uh, artists that Soroy would have looked up to. He's actually slightly older. He would have been one of, in fact, um, Soroy's tutors, either in Valencia. This is another Valencian-born artist. So he would have been a the sort of, uh, he would have encountered uh, Munzos, I can never quite get the pronunciation of this name, but he would have, um, Antonio, he would have met Antonio either in the Academy in Valencia or in Rome. And the lovers of Teruel, the story is very sad, it's basically a Spanish Romeo and Juliet here, so our beautiful lady is mourning the death of her beloved. Um, but the important thing is that this is what the authorities wanted. This is 1884, uh, my one by uh, Soroya is 1887. And this is, the, the, this is the sort of nationalistic Spanish historical subject that the authorities wanted. But this is Munzos in 1884. 
and this is him in 1910. A, a subtle change, I think you'll agree, um, not only um, in the colouring, um, but in the subject matter, in fact, just about in everything. And in fact, he belongs to a group, uh, Munzos, this is, uh, are often referred to as the Spanish colorists because they are lightening their palette and also this sort of amazing blinding light that I associate very much with Spain. This was actually painted on, in Palma de Majorca, okay, so on the Balearic Islands. So what precipitates this amazing uh, change, this shift from this academic straitjacket to this new vibrant uh, en plein air technique, painting directly from nature out of doors. A breath of fresh air is often literally what it's referred to. And the answer, of course, is going to Paris. So it was his friend, Gilles, who financed this trip to Paris. And this is actually painted during this Parisian interlude. He was there for several months. And he was able to see exhibitions uh, uh, which covered retrospectives of Jules Bastien Lepage, who had just died prematurely in 1884, and Adolf von Menzel, who was a great German artist, a realist, who was having his retrospective because he was 70 years old. And it was these two artists, rather than your Monets and your Renoirs and your Cezannes, that influenced the young Soroya. Already he's learning to paint white on white. So just so you, so you know what I'm referring to, um, because Bastien Lepage may not be familiar to you, he's probably the most influential artist of the 19th century, as he sort of managed to produce an academic version of Impressionism, one which was um, acceptable both to the authorities, but even more importantly, uh, to, the, to the public. Uh, so he uh, has a photographic technique, so super realist, He's very influenced, as you can see, by photography. He chooses subjects close to his heart of peasant life, which again carries with it a sort of a sense of morality. These are, you know, wholesome characters living close to the land. And we know that Soro really took Bastien Lepage's message to be true to themselves and to paint what they know best to heart, which is the reason why he will concentrate very much on those Valencian beach scenes. Menzel here, 1867. So remember that the first French Impressionist exhibition is 1874. We could have a lot of fun just comparing this image of the, the Tuileries Gardens of Menzel uh, with that of the, the famous one by Manet, you know, in the Tuileries Gardens. It's a wonderful uh, cross section of society. Nursemaids, a Breton nursemaid, as you can see, bottom left hand corner crying child, um, bourgeois, working class, a, a sort of almost again photographic veracity. This is 67, but he was still producing very similar works as you can see in 1880. And it was these two artists that had the greatest impact on the young uh, Soroya. So you can see from his contemporaries, they are undergoing the same transformation. So Amelia Sala here, again, we know was one of Soroya's tutors. Look, he's slightly um, older. He's born in 1850. Soroya's born in 1863. Here's your classic historical subject, one close to Spanish hearts, the expulsion of the Jews from Spain. My apologies, spelling mistake. And obviously relates to um, Isabella and the cleansing, as it were, of the Jews from Spain. But here he is, 1906, and he again, like Munzos, is often described as a Spanish colorist, as they uh, lighten their palette uh, to this almost, you know, diaphanous, uh, beautiful pastel, well, pastel colors here, but that one in Palma was pos positively, you know, luminous, wasn't it, in its colors. However, at this stage, the way to make money is to conform. And so the most famous artist of the 19th century, the one that made the most money, believe it or not, uh, was Jean-Noir Ernest Messonnier. Small cabinet pictures, uh, historical subjects, but more genre than historical. So rather than, you know, this is a big, serious subject, you know, a big moment in the history of Spain. 
the expulsion of the Jews. But a lot of people wanted historical genre scenes, so scenes of everyday life, not in fancy dress. And Messonnier was the man for that. Uh, the one at the top with the Cavaliers in it um, is the Messonnier that's in the Davis collection in Cardiff, very important collection of French painting. But the one down the bottom here is by Jose Villagas, uh, Cordero, and it's the same idea, it's called the Good Clan. They loved Cavaliers. Um, I suppose in Spain, this is the era of Cervantes, but again, it's sort of like, it's not really history painting, it's historical genre, and this made a lot of money. And they're going to be encouraged by the success of Maria Fortuny. Now, I know you all think that Fortuny is a dress designer. That's the sun. Okay. And uh, I know you're thinking he's Italian, but no, he's not. The family is Spanish. It's just they end up settling in Venice. And this is typical of Fortuny's work. And look, you can see how very short lived he is in terms of his meteoric or meteoric even success so he dies in 1874 he makes a lot of money with this sort of thing again it's not really history painting it's historical genre we have all these lovely chaps in fancy dress in a stupendously beautiful uh, palace but what they're checking out is the nude on the table um, and the title is choice of a model it went down a storm uh, he makes his a big breakthrough. He's got very short, but you know, incredibly popular over a short period in his career. The Spanish Wedding was incredibly well received. It's a huge painting. Again, it's fancy dress. It was inspired by by Goya in terms of the setting. So we're watching a wedding uh, taking place. But of course, what we really love are all the costumes. So here's a close up of one little corner. Uh, with their shawls and their mantillas and the blokes who all look as, the, as if they should be um, matadors. One of the reasons why, in the case of Fortuny, his palette lifts is travelling south. He spent quite a lot of time painting in Granada, as you'll see in a minute, but he spent equally a, a long time painting in North Africa in the Spanish colonies. And this also is to remind you that, um, well, Spain has colonies, but also this Orientalism that's such a potent force in late 19th century art. Fortuny is another Catalan artist. Rios is very near uh, to uh, Tarragona. And this is the carpet cellar, and it's in watercolour. Again, another way in which uh, watercolour is having a huge impact on oil. Again, it was making oils more free-flowing, but also raising the palette, you know, brighter colours. And the bright, glaring light of Andalusia and of North Africa. So it was particularly during his brief but influential sojourn in Granada that he had this beautiful house that he rented. This is the garden. You can see here what I mean about this bright, blinding light already in the 1870s this is coming to dominate Fortuny's painting don't bother about the woman and the dog they're actually painted in later uh, by Fortuny's brother-in-law artistic family um, but what I really want you to notice is things like the the colored shadow on the white wall of the tree and this just a blinding white light and also this idea of you know painting the Spanish scene Costume barista is what they are referred to. And this is not historical fancy dress. This is, you're back to your lovely Falera ladies. This is the local, uh, not peasant, because these dresses are too beautiful to be peasant dresses, but the, the beautiful local costumes. Costume barista is the name given to this uh, group of, uh, or this phase um, in painting. So although they're in the, they're quite small here, in front of the old city hall here, you can see the ladies uh, in their local costumes. And this costume brista ideal, costume brismo espanol, uh, another of the terms used, uh, was essentially a really good way for artists to make money. So during the Assisi period, when we know that he was painting that, you know, monumental work of Father Joffrey, he was making money painting these in watercolour 
intimate little scenes, the guitarist and probably the lady is, you know, going to sing. But the important thing is they're in the, you know, they're in a very local setting with the tile and most importantly in their beautiful costumes. And this uh, was uh, painted for uh, another painter, okay, uh, and art dealer, Francisco Jova Casanova. I'm not making that name up, I promise. And it's to remind you that a lot of these works are going to the colonies, the Spanish colonies in South America. So here's an even better one for, um, it's actually got, as you can see, Valencian customs in its title. So costume barista, which literally referring to these fabulous costumes. And again, it's the very, they're very romantic, you know, the tiles, the beautiful patio gardens and these fabulous dresses. So here they are, rather conveniently when we went to the uh, silk exchange in uh, Valencia, uh, several, several of the guides there are in costume. I love their hair. So you get these big bell-shaped dresses, all this lovely embroidery and lace, but the hair is amazing, isn't it? And, you know, a, a bit of Islam coming in there, surely, or Byzantium. When I first saw them with these things that look like headphones, now I wasn't thinking of Scott. Star Wars. I was thinking of Alphonse Moucha and those Art Nouveau ladies with their amazing um, uh, headdresses. Anyway, you can see here how you know the combs and the way that they, the very distinctive way that they do their hair, um, all comes over in these paintings, mostly in watercolour, so relatively inexpensive, could be easily uh, churned out, I will put it that way, because essentially this is how uh, Savoya made his living. And uh, most importantly, he is now part of a sort of like Valencian school who are all doing something uh, very similar. So this is Jose Venuri. Again, remember, we know him by his middle name. And this is in the uh, Tyson Museum in Malaga. And you can see here not only our lovely middle class ladies in their wonderful costumes, I love the donkey over there, uh, but you can also see in the background some of the landmarks of Valencia. Uh, there's the Migulet, the, the, the tower of the cathedral, and most importantly, the big gateway, the big medieval entrance uh, into Valencia, uh, the Serans or Serranos Gate, uh, which has survived. And we're coming up to the end of our first session, you'll be pleased to know. And I'm going to give you a little bit of light relief at the end. Because if you were visiting uh, Valencia, you would come out of this gate and you would uh, turn left along what was the edge of the river to visit the absolutely magnificent uh, studio house of uh, Ben Uri. We have here a dynasty of artists. So there's Jose and Mourinho, and then there's the son, who is always known by his familiar nickname, uh, Peppino. They were all close uh, to Soroya. As you'll see next week, I shall show you several portraits uh, by Soroya of the Benuri family. But most importantly, this fantastic studio house had a direct impact on the house that Soroya would plan uh, in Madrid. So I was there with Scott uh, in February, which believe it or not, is when all the oranges ripen. And you're in like, as you can see here, a, a wonderful quiet oasis away from the hustle and bustle of uh, Valencia. It's uh, looking back here, so we're sitting with, you know, I've turned round literally, and we're looking back at the studio house which accommodated Jose Ben Uri and his son, Peppino. And um, you can see here all the beautiful tiles on the walls. Again, remember Valencia is a major center uh, for tile production. So I couldn't resist showing you one of the, the beautiful Falara ladies, Falaras, Falara, it's good, isn't it? Uh, I could sing this, uh, but it's this beautiful, again, uh, tile panel with these indicative uh, Valencian motifs, the fruit, the grapes, the flowers, and the beautifully clad young ladies. And looking the other way, uh, the tiles again, you can see the sort of Islamic elements coming in, obviously in Hispano Moresque where, and we'll come back to this uh, beautiful studio house in our last 
session by sort of making some comparisons to that of Soroya in Madrid. Uh, it was an ancient city, it was Phoenician, it was Roman. So the thing to remember about all these artists is they wanted to be rich and famous. They wanted to create beautiful homes. They were all avid collectors. So taking you into the studio, again, this is the studio here in the background. This is the entrance with the tiles to either side. I will just remember that at this stage in his life, uh, not only uh, Ben Uri, but obviously uh, Soroya, his goal in the 1880s is to conform to what the authorities want, because like many artists, his goal was to be rich and famous. I don't actually see anything wrong with that, but in fact, uh, modern scholarship sort of rather frowns on artists who became rich and famous, as we'll discover next week. So Roya manages to achieve that goal and also stay true to his, um, uh, his own artistic ambitions, which was to paint quickly out of doors in the bright Spanish sunshine but more of that next week. Right, so this, as you can see, has got my website address, so which is anne-anderson, not a slash or an underscore, but anne-anderson.com. And then this is my YouTube channel. Uh, you'll find the YouTube channel link on my <laughs> webpage. So the main thing is you've got the anne-anderson.com because that will take you to everything. And, uh, and I will also send the link uh, to Susan to send out to you directly, because we want to encrypt our YouTube um, presentation of this particular lecture. But you'll find other short films on my YouTube channel that you might find interesting. So I did this little one about 10, 15 minutes on, on the Ben Uri house. Um, in Valencia. So if you want to see more of that and a bit more detail about it, yeah. you'll find it on my YouTube channel.